some good stuff. Yeah, nice. And we are live, guys. Are we? Welcome to today's webinar um, today with Duda. And we have a very good friend of mine that I've not seen for maybe two, three years, Mr. Harsh Agarwal from India, the owner of the infamous shoutmeloud.com blog, Harsh. I think we last seen each other, it was pre-COVID, um, Portugal, probably. Milan. Oh, Milan. 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 Yeah. Milan. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, we have met each other at various events around the world, but for anyone who doesn't know who you are, can you give us a brief introduction? Okay, yeah, I mean, that's that's my favorite part of the entire, you know, getting started is like, hi, for a lot of you who don't know me, I'm Harsh Agarwal. Uh, I started my journey as a professional blogger back in 2008. And that time blogging was not like a real career. And I saw the, that as an opportunity. I left my white collar job at Accenture. Uh, and I paved, uh, joined this, uh, you know, the, the world of remote, uh, the world of laptop or uh, laptop lifestyle. And I made a mission that I would enable other people to uh, follow their passion and monetize it. And that's what I did with Shout Me Loud. Shout Me Loud is my first project, which is still live. And uh, it has won numerous awards. It has helped numerous individuals throughout the globe to start, follow their passion and start a career. And this is what I've been doing. And this is what I enjoy doing. Uh, I, I don't see this as my work. This is more more like a play for me. This is what I do. Uh, I enjoy doing this. And that's that's who I am. Good man, good introduction. Guys, we are going to be picking the brains of Harsh, trying to extract as much information as we can on how you can turn your blog into something that actually makes you money. Um, so you do have the opportunity to ask questions over in the live chat. Um, I will be picking Harsh's brain as well. Um, and... Uh, yeah, we want to get as much value as we can for you guys. So make sure you do. Let us know where you're from and any questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, we've all been there, and I'm sure Harsh, back when he started his blog in 2008, was asking the same questions that you're likely to ask today. So um, please do feel free to ask. Um, <coughs> but Harsh, just want to talk a little bit about you, your journey first and foremost, uh, why those people are still coming in. Um, <laughs> I, I tell people this story, and you're probably not aware of this story. Um, we were talking face-to-face uh, -face in Milan, and uh, my content writer was with me, and I'm like, and I'm looking at your blog, Shout Me Loud. Now, I've got 400 live blog posts on my blog, <laughs> and uh, I told her to look at your site map. <laughs> now I'm thinking, yes, I'm doing well with blogging. I've got a lot of content out there. I'm pumping it out. And then we looked at your site map and we're like, oh my God, this guy has literally got a post for everything. Um, and I, I checked again previously just uh, to coming on here. Um, and you're still smashing it out. But you see this as a hobby for you. Um, it's obviously been there since 2008, but many people, you know, talk about content strategies and content marketing, and we all know that content's a big part of SEO. How, does, how would someone starting today decide? Where, how did you decide? Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I like SEO, and I'm going to start sharing tips on all things digital marketing. Um, what, what was your content strategy like? Did you just throw hundreds out there and then adapt or how did it work? Oh, great. Uh, that's a fantastic question. And, you know, when I started, like I was always into technology and I started as a tech blogger and I was talking about mobile phone and technology, technology stuff. But then I was getting decent traffic from social networking side. There was a popular platform called Dig and I used to drive significant amount of traffic from there. Uh, but then I was like, 
uh, how can I drive organic traffic when I'm not like, when I don't have to do, you know, social bookmarking or have to go and submit at multiple platforms like StumbleUpon? I mean, I'm talking about 2008 era, okay? And this is where I discovered SEO. So SEO was like more of a pain point for me. And at the same time, of course, I was not aware that one can make money from the blog. And I discovered that, oh, I can also make money from the blog. So I was like, okay, this thing is really serious. And especially I'm from India, in my country, nobody was teaching that. And in fact, in the world, there were like two, three people, like I, I believe you might be knowing Darren Rouse, John Chow, like they were the people who were like teaching more about blogging as a business. So I saw that as an opportunity and I just started writing about, sharing about everything that I was doing. And of course, uh, there was a lot of success and there was a lot of failure and I was putting everything as it is. Uh, and SEO was something, you know, I discovered because it was a pain point for me and I was just uh, learning from a lot of places. From I was talking to a lot of experts. I was not shy to reach out to the people who are like really good in the industry and ask them like, hey, uh, help me configure the WordPress SEO plugin. Uh, you know, I think, I think that time it was not Yoast. It was something called something else, all-in-one SEO plugin. Uh, so there was this guy called Mani Kartik. Okay, I reached out to him and he, his blog helped me to set up the plugin. So I would not take all the credit because I learned everything from watching and learning from everyone else. And what I did is, uh, one of I believe one of my superpower is that I see thing, complicated thing, and I can explain it in a very simpler word for others to understand in the form of text. And uh, that that's how, that's been my superpower, and that's how I started getting into the world of SEO. Interesting, interesting. Um, we've got a question um from brian bloom in the audience yeah. here hello guys in the audience also see path blair um bapaditia um hans knapp david chris good to see you all guys there but brian has a question obviously you you start out and you're throwing your content out there and and, and blogging about your passion but how does one make money now a lot of people look at this and go there's a lot of information here. Now, you obviously have a big mailing list. You do potentially um, have the ability to make money through affiliate or ad revenue. What What is the current way that you're monetizing a blog that has lots of content on it? Yeah, so, uh, you know, like, let me start with one thing. You know, ad revenue like AdSense or Propeller Ads or Media.net Ads are good for the blogs who have who are working on multi-niche or who don't know who their audience is. You know, in that case, you let this programmatic ad company decide what ad to show for the people. But when you know who your audience are, like my audience are the people who want to start their own online business, want to grow their online business. I know what are their pain points, what are the product they need. So in that case, using affiliate marketing is the best. So uh, earlier what I was doing, I was using AdSense and affiliate marketing. Now, once I realized that I understand my audience uh, pain point better, I re removed all the AdSense ad and replaced that, those with banner ads, which are actually affiliate ads. So affiliate ads is one of the uh, one of the medium. Second medium is sponsored post. So let's say a company reach out to me and they say like, hey, Harsh, would you review us? And of course, I have a certain criteria before I accept any company to be part of Shout Me Lord. Uh, and those standards are very high. Like we don't let any uh, company which which might run away in six months or two years, we don't let them to be a part of our uh, organization. So we do our due diligence. If we like them and we see that they are doing something significant, they're not just another copy of another product and they add real value, we we. We take, we do the sponsored review for them and we always crack a better deal with them. Like not just the sponsored review, we ask them for high commission rather than, you know, like the standard 30% commission. We yeah. ask them for giving us 50 or 60% of the commission because uh, because it's a win-win eventually, right? Uh, so this, these are the two. Then third is the listicle. So this is this this is something not a lot of people are doing. So let's say you have a listicle post, for example, top 10 WordPress hosting. Now a company says like, hey, I want to get listed there, which a lot of companies actually reach out to. What I do is uh, I ask them like, okay, to get listed on this website, uh, this particular page, this will I'll be charging you this much. And it will be only for one year. So I just rent out that space. I don't sell that space forever. A lot of people make the mistake of like giving them the position forever. That's a bad, uh, I, I mean, it, it's okay. Like if you're on the second or third page, but if you're on the first page, you should always rent out for one year and then reach out to them after one year with whatever the new price. And what you can do with that, like, you know, let's say if you're renting out for a thousand dollar a piece, 
Now you can actually spend $500 building more backlink to that particular blog post. So to maintain that first position or improve your first position, uh, position on the first page, that ways it works out pretty amazing. Uh, then I have my products like eBooks and courses, uh, which I don't market much. I believe because I believe in the free content much, but the, uh, paid product is more for the people who want the direct access to me. So, you know, we have the Facebook group, WhatsApp group for those people. Ebooks are something which I've been doing since 2016. I like writing and, you know, like I was in Thailand and one day, okay, let me come, let me write a book about affiliate marketing. And that's how I wrote my first version of uh, affiliate marketing handbook. And uh, I think I first time I priced it at $39. It was way too much. But yeah, people, people were liking it. And, you know, I was getting good reviews. And then, like, of course, I started uh, uh, tinkering with the pricing. And then I found the sweet spot. And that's another good revenue source for us. Uh, what else? I'm pretty sure there are many more, Craig. Uh, once, <laughs> once we deep dive, we'll find much way more. <laughs> we'll come back to that. I'm sure there'll be many more questions on how you can make money using these. However, um, Hans has a question, and it's a question uh, that relates to content on these websites. Um, obviously, you started out 2008 when AI was was probably not even a thought, um, so a lot of your work would have been hand-done. Does that remain the case to this day, or are you... Do you think AI-generated content can or will work anytime in the near future? Okay, so I have two thoughts. Like one is how I do it. One, what I would suggest to you about the AI-generated content. I'll start with what I do. So I don't create generic content. I create the content which actually takes significant amount of time and effort before creating the content. Like I actually put, you know, spend time using a tool or testing any strategy before I start writing it. So AI kind of content won't help me in that case. But on the second note, and I don't think I'll ever use AI generated content for my blog post, but I might use it for my uh, landing pages. The pages which are not SEO related, number one, like where I don't want the, you know, Google search to start sending me traffic. Second, which I want, because I, I mean, I'm, I'm a good writer, but I don't think I'm the best copywriter. And I think AI could create much better copies, the marketing copies, like ad copies or like, you know, uh, your about page or for example, your uh, landing page copies. So AI can assist you with a lot of copies, but uh, I don't think one should rely on AI to generate copy because AI, AI content is very predictable. And I, I mean, you know, I don't think they will have a taste like the human touch forever. And of course, there is always a future for AI. I'm not saying like it's, it's not going to work. I know a lot of people uh, are making using AI generated uh, content to create blogs. Craig, are you doing that? Nope. Nope. Okay. Perfect. Um, I wish I wish there was such a tool that we could do that. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm lazy. I, w I would love to, but I just don't think it produces good work. Oh no, they don't. They they are horrible. So for, just for the hang of it, like I tried a tool to create tweets and stuff. I did that, you know, out of curiosity. I like to try new tools, but I don't see a value value in them. And I I feel like you know they are just. Uh, I mean, once you start using them, you know, it's like once you move from manual car to an automatic car, you can't go back to manual car. I'm I'm a manual car driver, <laughs> though. I mean, it's a it's a very wrong correlation because automatic car is good. But the AI, AI, with the AI content, you're not doing justice to your own creativity and to your audience. You can always take assistance with, uh, with the help of AI writing tool, probably 20, 30%, then add your uh, own character to it, and then, you know, take it forward. So I want to dig a little bit deeper, because um, there'll be a lot of people in here who are bloggers and all that kind of stuff. Now, when it comes to the actual content strategy, what does it look like? Do you write, because you mentioned uh, that you're maybe not the best copywriter in the world. I am very similar. I'm not the best writer in the world. Now I've got the knowledge. I know what I want to say. Do you like maybe t uh, record your voice and then give that to a copywriter? Or are you writing it and then giving it to a copywriter to edit and potentially optimize? What What is your content strategy like? Uh, you mean to say the content strategy or how do I produce the content? Yeah, how do you produce the content? Right. So uh, I think on my website, 90% of the content is written by me. 
uh, I, sometime there are times when I work with niche expert writer, for example, for the WordPress beat, we had like one or two writers who are very, who are the developer who are very passionate about the industry and they can, you know, write much better. They can actually give much better insight and input about WordPress plugins or themes. So I let them take care of those categories. Uh, I So if it's a listicle, I do uh, my due diligence. I tell them like, okay, these are the five plugins that you should be including. And I give them the opportunity to add six, seven from their perspective, because of course people like independence. And since they are really good, they really do a good justice. Sometimes, you know, they suggest something bad, which I we can, uh, which I remove at the time of editing. Uh, yeah, but you know, I, I, I would not recommend follow my strategy because with my strategy, you will be working 16 hours a day. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, it, it's better to like, you know, I mean, these days like uh, blogging is like a serious business, right? Like, you know, you spend like thousand dollar, you can probably make fifteen hundred, two thousand dollar, maybe more. So, uh, and the content velocity is a real thing. Like, you know, the more content you push within a shorter span of time your blog would start ranking higher and sometime it might outrank the high DA blogs also. So yeah, uh, the best way is to hire writers. When you hire writers, you should have your uh, brand guidelines. Like, you know, what is the tone that one should be writing? And if you're working with multiple writers, then you should have an editor because an editor would ensure that even if you're working with three or four different writers, they would refine all the language in one uh, tone so that your reader would not feel like, you know, they are juggling from one place to another. Like, you know, it's not like different cities of India. Like you go from North India to South India, it's like different country altogether. So yeah, that's what kind of experience you want to give to your blog readers. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting uh, take on that. Um, but, you know, writing 90% of your content um, it, it is crazy. So I think delegation... Um, and stuff are really important. And, and like you say, you would probably advise, um, you know, getting writers in. But that that brings another problem. Where the hell do you get good writers? Now, people will say South Africa because they've got a lower cost of living, they're native English speakers and so on and so forth. Where do you think or, or where do you go to to, to find your content writers? Okay, uh, so since I work in a particular niche, for example, let's say WordPress or SEO or affiliate marketing, what I would do is I would look at the other bloggers, other blogs, bloggers and blogs, okay? So I'm talking about like entry or mid-level bloggers and other blogs, which are like high-level blogs, but they have like a lot of authors publishing there. And if I like their piece of content, I would reach out to them. I would ask them like, hey, uh, you know, I really like your content. Could you recommend somebody whom you know who can write me uh, in particular space? You know, like I'm, I'm actually not asking them very directly that like, hey, do you want to work with me? I mean, sometimes I do, but uh, I, I see like the failure rate in that case is high because people would probably say like, hey, I'm busy. Or sometimes they get very excited that, hey, Harsh Agarwal from Shout Me Loud is reaching. I want to work with him. It's good. Uh, but if you reach out in a way saying like, you know, hey, I want to, can you suggest somebody? And if the guy is free, they will say like, hey, yeah, I'm available for writing. And then you decide how much you want to pay. Uh, do you want to pay per word or do you want to pay per article? I usually prefer paying per word because it keeps the thing simpler, you know, like because the article can go up to 2,000, 2,500 words. Sometimes it can be 1,000 words. So, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there are like a lot of content websites where you can, uh, the content write, the writer writing websites where you can hire a content writer. But that is like a lot of trial. But if you are using something like Content Mill, you're creating a lot, you know, you need a lot of authors. What you can do is you can use this platform called ProBlogger, jobs.ProBlogger. And I usually have found really good writers from there. And now if you plan to hire like, you know, 10, 20 writers, you should use this platform called Workelo, W-O-R-K-E-L-L-O, workelo.com. And uh, from there, you can automate the entire process of hiring your writers. Interesting. I'm going to take a note of that myself. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll, I'll give you the YouTube link later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I uh, appreciate that as a knowledge bomb right there, guys. Um, but it's all good and well doing content. Um, link building. Um, Hans is asking a question. Do you actively do link building, like buying links or doing digital PR or anything like that to these blog posts 
so hence what i do is like uh, i focus on creating content before anybody else produces in particular topic and that gives me an edge and usually that brings a, bro- a lot of link at times i work with agencies like you know probably i've worked with agencies probably two or three times in my entire 14 years of career and i've given them a package of let's say build 100 backlinks to my you know this 20 blog posts which are like evergreen content and they do high quality guest blogging outreach so what i give them is like an access to one of my email from there they reach out, they do all the leg like, work of reaching out to the uh, other blogs websites where they position me as an author i give them the topic like they run th- the topic ideas through me i give them the outline and then those article goes live so i take my content very seriously but yeah i work with the agencies to build the backlinks uh but i think for the backlink bit craig i think you're the best guy so why don't you throw some knowledge bomb there <laughs> i mean you you have to in my opinion um get backlinks now if someone is looking for a name of an agency that does that like links for you.com is just one that are doing the outreach guest posting thing that that you talk about harsh um you know, but there's a million different um, link building agencies out there. And I think for me, building power and authority to that evergreen content or those pages that are making you a lot of money, it would be crazy not to um, do that. So I think everyone, one way or another, now, obviously, if you're a new blogger, <laughs> Harsh can probably pull links because it's Harsh Agarwal and he's probably the most famous uh, blogger uh, from India uh, so that probably attracts links alone but I think for anyone out there who doesn't have that domain authority you have to probably do that more aggressively than than someone like uh, Harsh yeah. well, uh, I, I would like to suggest a service it's called shortlist.io short mm-hmm. s-h-o-r-t-l-i-s-t dot i-o they do a fantastic job these guys are from us and uh you know if you're ordering in bulk they do a fantastic job they don't do build like shit link they build high quality link where i guess posting so and then i use this service from this uh guy called uh pratik dholakia he's from gujarat he run uh an agency called grow fusely uh and he, he again does a wonderful fantastic job little slow but that's the nature of this kind of work. And yeah. Um, also, one other little thing um, on content writing before we move on, because um, we've got other questions there. Kenya is, and South Africa is a good place for content writers as well. We've got someone in Kenya um, down there, I, I channel, um, but that I have also heard that as well. Um, that, that those places are good. Uh, just in terms of country and price. But Pars Suba has a question for you, Harsh. Do you mark all of your affiliate outbound links as REL equals sponsored? Um, and what has worked for you so far? So are you marking these as sponsored? Yeah. So, you know, I use this plugin called Thursday Affiliate, which has this feature. You can like with one click, you can just make all your affiliate link as either no follow or uh, you can add REL skills to sponsored. And I've done the same. I mean, I mean, there's no problem doing that. Right. Like, you know, uh, but but yeah, one important thing, like if your blog has like all links as affiliate link, that's a problem. That could be a problem. So you need to have a good balance of uh, affiliate link and the genuine links to you know outbound link to the genuine website. So yeah, yeah. But part part to answer your question, yes, I do mark them as Ariel is to sponsored. Um, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so <coughs> going on to the actual um, you know, people out there that are listening, going bloody hell, Harsh has done well. Um, he, he's done his thing in a specific niche. Talking about uh, keyword research and, and and all that kind of stuff, what does that look like for you? Do you do that part yourself as well? What do you do? You look to other SEOs for inspiration, or are you just simply going into tools like SEMrush or whatever it might be to find stuff based on search volume? How do you do your keyword research for your content? Yeah, it's a mixture of all the things. So you know, like why when you're like too deep into a particular niche, you get a lot of ideas. You could see like certain theme or certain topic would like take off 
uh, really well in probably six months or three months or a year. So those keywords may or may not be in the in any of the SEO tools. So those are the ideas like that actually uh, takes you to gives you that uh, advantage where if you publish content now, you will be on the first page because you're one of the first few to uh, publish. So I do that. And of course, I do a mix of everything. I do competitor research. I do keyword gap analysis to identify some of the keywords that I can quickly rank for. Now, to be honest, like since those kind of content, uh, ideally a lot of time, I'm not very interested in writing them, but they are very important for my business. Now, those are the uh, content I outsource at times so that my uh, my entire topic coverage is there because Google actually appreciate it. Like, you know, if you're, if you're basically focusing on a particular topic, but uh, let's say a WordPress hosting for an example, right? And if you're not written about cloud WordPress hosting or managed WordPress hosting, but you have all other content, Google may not like it. And to complete the entire topical relevance, you need to have those content about these two or three missing pieces. So for this, I do uh, you know the keyword gap analysis with the other websites, which are uh, which are uh, which Google sees as an authority in the in particular field, and uh, and I put them in Trello. So I use Trello to manage my content board, and I put everything on the Trello, and then I start uh, figuring out like which content goes to me, which content will go to a particular author. If I know this uh, this author is particular particularly good for this particular content, I assign it to them, and that's how my content. Uh, uh, structure the research and uh, production goals. Now, I, I would like to add a few things here, Craig. So I use this tool called Fras, Fras.io, to create the content brief. Because what I've seen, when you are writing yourself, you also need a content structure to write. You can't go about writing anything random which is coming to your head. You need to properly structure your content. And sometimes it's, it's a great idea to take help from what Google is already seeing uh, uh, something working for the top, the websites which are on the first page. So those can give you a lot of inspiration. And especially if you're working with authors, then you need to give them the proper content structure uh, so that they can come up with a piece which would be actually useful for your readers and you also have a chance to rank on the first page in the Google. I think that that's a very valid point. Um, I see so many people... Um, <laughs> To, you know, go to the content writers and they give them a bullet point of like 20 things to write over the next month and that's it. Phrase, as you say, gives you the, the top 20 search results, it gives you statistics, it gives you FAQs, it basically creates the content brief for you. Um, so can't, uh, you know, suggest that any um, more um, than, than you have. However, what I do see, Harsh, um, is... When it comes to content, a lot of people, you, you mentioned the topical cluster there. Um, you know, when you're going to write about WordPress hosting and you're doing your research, and you know, obviously your parent topic is potentially going to be WordPress hosting, and then you've got your supporting articles, which might be cloud, whatever, cloud hosting, or uh, you know, whatever else is going to internally link into that. Do you do a full topical cluster? And then move on to something else like, you know, how to get more engagement on Twitter or, you know, what's the best keyword research tool? Do you build it out like that or is it a more different approach? Now, uh, that's a very good question. So my my content uh, part, like, you know, all these articles should be, would be there. But then like one day I wake up and then I had a great talk with Craig and Craig gave me a very fantastic idea that like, how do you run a live stream on YouTube? You know, I'm just just... Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I think like it's going to be very useful for a lot of people. Now that way, th that's where I actually go and publish about this. So again, as I said, I do blogging for fun, and I know the money would come. But if I would do with the like a business, like a serious business, uh, then I might not do this. I would actually just complete the gap of WordPress hosting before moving to any other category or topic, because that's what uh, because what I want that Google should understand that my my blog, my website is a authoritative uh, uh, you know a place for the topic called wordpress hosting so i would not divert from that particular topic and this is something which i would like to give away today to all the audience who are listening that if you're if you're creating a website or if you have a website instead of uh, your your website talking about multiple topics you should 
and if you have done this in the past it's all okay okay but now if you need to look at what are the topics or category that your website is already ranking good for and what is the topic a, th- a category that you think you want to continue because you can't continue with five different category in the future because a lot has changed uh, and as we you know as a, uh, as we move ahead in this journey uh, google will, would appreciate or uh, you know award a website which is about a very small topic for example wordpress plugin or wordpress security plugin if a blog is only about wordpress security plugin published like 30 40 high quality articles and of course it's not just about publishing new article you also need to go back after every few months and update those old article to keep them you know up to date with the new information so google would appreciate that so the approach should be the right approach should be to focus on one category and one category only that's what your blog and website should be about but yeah if you, if you are very big and no i mean even if you are very big like you know this this strategy of having multiple category may not work and we have seen a lot with that about.com uh, and a lot of other websites who have failed doing that interesting um <laughs> Hans has a question for you. Um, so, when you accept um, an, a, you know, a promotion, for example, let's say it's WordPress that came to you and want you to promote WordPress, would you also do affiliate for the likes of Wix or Duda? Do, do you care or do you stick like with Same Rush, for example, if Same Rush came to you, you're the top affiliate. Would you go and promote some of their uh, rivals? I would, uh, because I, uh, for example, I mean, it's a very valid point that I like SEM Rush, and I think they are a fantastic mm-hmm. tool. But then, in the space, there is there is a need for Mangools.com or Hrefs.com or any other SEO tool out out there, and I can actually do justice to my own content and to my audience when I am actually reviewing and trying and testing these other tools, that's where I can actually say like, hey, SMrush is the best in this particular uh, part. And then this other tool is good in this particular part. So as as a, as a, as a um, uh, matter expert, I need to play with all other tools in order to, uh, you know, to write about this particular category. And now talking about affiliate, uh, yes, I'll take, what I usually do is I would start with basic affiliate with most of them. I don't tell them like, hey, I want a preferred rate uh, or something. I would start with the basic rate. When I see like, okay, now the sales are increasing. Once I've given them something and I know I can scale it up because this tool is growing. And usually like initially you never know which tool would grow or not grow, right? Uh, I would then ask them and reach out then like, hey, I want, uh, I I will give you the preferred placement because I think you deserve it. I mean, of course, I would not tell them. No, yeah. no one. But but then I would like negotiate a deal with them, which would be win-win for both. Uh, that's that. That is the one approach I take. Then second time, you know, like somebody wants to, let's say Duda, for example, uh, comes and say like, hey, I want to be placed on like this five base CMS platform or these pages. And I look at Duda and I like the Duda as like, I think like this, this uh, CMS dip deserves to be there. Then I would crack affiliate plus placement uh, plus review deal. That's that's how I approach. And out of curiosity, in terms of the actual affiliate deals that are on option, um, you know, you've got the ability to get like a one-off fee when someone signs up. You've got monthly recurring revenue. What attracts you personally? Because obviously you're experienced uh, and people want to know based on your experience. Are you looking for the monthly recurring revenue do you even care or can there be good money made on um, like the one-off fees? Uh, so hmm, that's a very interesting question. And there is no, it's not binary answer, Craig. It's not zero or one. It's very subjective depending on the product to product companies to companies. Like there are certain companies that I, uh, I think they're very good fit, but their management is not as uh, agile as they should be. I know this is a good product today, but it may not be a very good product after a year. You know, like you, when you look at hundred different products, you can actually see that. In that case, I would prefer one off fees because I will do my job, I'll do my research, I'll spend three days of my time trying, testing, and writing about this tool. Uh, so I'll probably go with one off or one off plus recurring, uh, or sometime I'll just go with recurring. Uh, so my recurring is usually uh, my one-off fees is mostly when the people are reaching out to me, like they want a placement on my website. 
Yeah. I don't go go out and reach like, hey, uh, I'm going to review you, pay me this. Like, I don't care about that, and I don't need to because I already have 50 different tools that I personally want to try, and probably out of them, 10 or 15, I would like and I want to write about them, and sooner or later they will have an affiliate program. Sooner or later they will have an affiliate program. I don't know if many of you would know this story. I'm super affiliate for SM Rush. Of course, Craig knows this. Uh, but when I started writing about SM Rush, they did not have an affiliate program, Craig, for three years. Mm-hmm. And they were not paying me anything. I was just writing about them because they were really, really fantastic. And one day, like, they launched their affiliate program and, you know, like, the money started flowing. And this has happened multiple times with multiple tools. So uh, I, I think, like, you know, the approach should be the money is the byproduct, your audience first, your content should be the uh, center of uh, everything. And that's how you will drive traffic. And I'm talking about that's how you'll also earn your audience loyalty. The people would trust you more. And even with the smaller audience, you would make much more sales than having a very high traffic blog, but less sales. So a question I want to ask you again, based on your own experience, what what are some of the things that some of the, the, the people potentially watching that maybe want to get into affiliate, what do we need to look out for in terms of cookie policy? Because Clearly, you have a lot of traffic. Now, you will have sent a lot of traffic to an affiliate before, and it's probably not been tracked that well, or the cookie policy is not weighted in your favor. So then you're potentially losing out money. What kind of tips could you give to people to look out for so that you don't get tripped up by that type of thing? Yeah, uh, so usually the cookie policy, of course, makes a difference. 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, it's company policy. And I'm okay with 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. I don't care about that, like, you know, because I'm not running paid ads. If you're running paid ads, then, of course, you have to pay special attention to that part because some tool takes 40 days or 80 days to convert, you know, from the trial to being a paid user. So that's where you, of course, want to pay attention. Uh, But what I really pay attention to is what affiliate network they're using you know a lot of times what happens is that a lot of companies start with their first promoter or like you know uh, their in-house affiliate program and of course usually their in-house affiliate program is not very scalable and they they will eventually switch to something else or sometimes they the in-house affiliate program will not track the sales pretty well that's a red flag and uh, they it has happened a lot of time you know they would probably keep switching their affiliate program every three months and that become a pain uh, so that is one of the things which I pay close attention to. And the second, you also have to give a ch- I mean, if you're working with bigger brands, it's all good. If you're working with a smaller brand, uh, you know, uh, then you have to give them benefit of doubt that uh, they will, of course, as they grow, they will move to something bigger like impact.com or avin.com or, you know, cj.com. So, yeah. Interesting. No, I was just curious to know if you, <laughs> if you had similar experiences uh, what was your experience been? Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's interesting. Just be, be careful in the cookie policies, guys. Um, but going back to the monetization um, on the, the websites, Harsh, um, people always think you have to have one method of monetization. Um, do you, like, are there posts in your website that potentially have like multiple, like it could be an affiliate post, but it could also generate leads. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Do you ever, or do you have posts that potentially work as an affiliate, maybe have some banner ads on it and whatnot, but also collect data, emails, or even generate leads? Is that something any like you try and do or... Yeah. Uh, so, you know, back in 2000, uh, between 2012 to 2015, I used to offer services. One of my very popular services was Blogspot to WordPress migration. Mm-hmm. So I was helping user to migrate from Blogspot to WordPress. And I think I was charging about uh, $200 to $400 per, and it was like one hour, one to two hour of task, right? Uh, so I used to generate those lead by creating the blog content and putting, uh, usually I, initially I started by, uh, writing them like, Hey, if you need help with this, you can do it yourself. I was giving them all the steps, but if you need help with this from me or my team, write an email to service at the rate of shortmail.com. And that's how I started generating leads for my services. Similarly, I used to offer WordPress SEO services. 
uh, and block consultancy. Uh, yeah, those those are things I used to do. I don't do them anymore. But yeah, uh, that's how I used to do. It. But I think what you're asking is the lead generation in today's date, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I if I have a chance, I would do that because you can sell the leads, you can monetize the leads from multiple. Leads. You can sell the same leads to five different companies. To give you a good example, uh, and so that people can also connect, is let's say you have a real estate website, right? And you uh, you're selling, you're talking about top ten real estate um, location in Dubai, for example, right? And uh, you can ask people to submit their app uh, detail for getting a callback for you know for for whatever they inquiry about the real estate, and then you can sell those lead to four different agencies. And uh, you know, make money from there. Yeah. Oh. Do you have any? Do you have any thought or any idea that you want to add? I think you know. I think the point I would try and just get across to people is, when you've got traffic, there are multiple options out there. Be creative. Think like like Harsh. Uh, you just mentioned. Um, you know, you were able to to sell a service as well as probably educate and potentially you know get some affiliate traffic in there as well. So you don't have to just have one piece of content that just sells a product or a service. There can be multiple ways to, to monetize that traffic. So there's not much else I can yeah. add to uh, that. Yeah. Craig, I would like to add something and, you know, like from the experience, you know, what I was doing. So back in 2016, 17 is when the guest blogging thing was catching up. Like the people were like looking for list of guest blog where they can uh, submit guest posts. So I created a blog, which is like list of 150 websites where you can submit guest posts. And the blog was ranking on the first page, driving insane amount of traffic. What I did is I added another 100 website in a PDF, including those 150. So that's 250 websites in a PDF. And I started selling them for like, you know, $3.99. $3.99 was just paying for my coffee. But it was not one coffee. It was 100 coffee a day, which was a fantastic money. You know? <laughs> so, 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 so the takeaway is like, if you have a high traffic uh, page, as Craig was saying, like you should have, you have to think creatively how you can monetize it. So instead of affiliate, you, how you can turn it into a product. I mean, the key is that you should always pay attention how you can convert anything to a product. The product could be an informational product, but the best product is if you can convert that into a SaaS product, and you know that will be a game changer for your career. And just just a quick one on top of that, uh, Harsh, just for anyone listening. Obviously, you've done very well with your blog. Do you ever do paid ads, or is this all pure organic? It's all pure organic. I I tried my hands on paid ads, but I realized you know there is. I can be uh, jack of all trades and master of none. Rather, I would be master of some and, you know, like uh, SEO is working out good. Of course, I, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of challenge with SEO. The predictability, predictability is not there, which is a big problem with the SEO. But I know one thing, Google does not hate me and I don't do anything wrong. You know, like maybe, maybe, maybe I am not giving the right signal to Google at times, which may happen. And that's the time when I fold my sleeve and, get more focused and work for like six, eight months without losing focus. And I get back, you know, like, for example, I was probably doing like 2 million page views a long time back. Now I'm 210, so 90% down. It's shit, right? <laughs> but, hey, but, 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 but then like I was focusing on multiple different niche uh, in last four years, which has made me pay more money than Shout Me Loud. And I think like Shout Me Loud has done a fantastic job. And as I was telling earlier, like focusing on multiple category is a bad, a bad idea. And I'm telling you from experience. And I'm I, I'm considering to move some of my category to their own niche blog, and yeah. then focus shout lot on one or two niche only, or like category which become its own niche. Yeah. So <laughs> you mentioned obviously shout me loud is the the one that you're probably most famous for, but you are doing blogging and making money from it on other projects right you do have other affiliate obviously you're not going to tell us what the niches are and uh, wouldn't expect you to do so but you are repeating this process in other verticals right uh yeah what i do is let's say if i see a particular um you know subtopic on my website uh seeing a lot of traffic what i do is i create a 20 30 page website on, on that particular topic 
um since i know like that topic is catching up now those those 20 30 page website may be getting let's say 300 400 page views a day but the conversion rate is way 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 higher and they they do really well interesting interesting and you've got some stuff being shown up here how you can earn Fifty thousand pounds every month from niche blogging. There is a lot of money to be made, Harsh, but we have to be realistic as well. Obviously, you've done that over um, a long period of time. Uh, Fourteen years you've been in the industry. What is a realistic expectation for for some of the viewers? And um, you know, if someone goes, do you know what? I can write a blog. You know, I, I'm I'm inspired by this, and I can make some money. What is a realistic time scale? And, and you always, you will always get asked this question, how many blogs should I post before I start making money? Now, the reason I'm asking this is <laughs> I've got friends who want to get into affiliate marketing and they come to me and they'll go, yeah, Craig, you know, I've spent the last four months working really hard. I've now got six blog posts up and you're like, I'm sorry, dude, that, that you know, <laughs> that's not going to work. Realistically, how long does it take to make money and what would you consider a good starting point in terms of, is it 20, is it 50, is it 100? What is the best starting point for someone? Oh, very good question. And I wish if, if, if there would be a simple answer to that, Craig. <laughs> but let, 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 let me try to uh, give my thoughts on this, okay? Uh, so first thing, uh, when you if you're starting as a completely newbie, be ready to fail on your first one or two blog. And it's completely natural. You know, like a lot of people actually quit blogging because they fail and they don't get traffic. I mean, most, mostly the reason is they fail to drive traffic and they hence they fail to monetize and they quit. Uh, the question you have to ask, like, why you're not able to drive traffic? You know, like Google does not know you. They don't hate you, of course. So uh, there could be a few reasons. One of the reasons is that you are blogging in a niche that is too crowded. Second, you suck as an author or a writer which usually happen that either your writing is not good, which of course is very much okay. If you're just starting out, you can, it will always take like six months or a year to get to you to a stage where people want to read you or you don't have the uh, domain knowledge, right? You were just reading, rehashing the content from other websites. You started a pet dog food blog and you're just reading content from other websites and you rehashing. You don't even have a dog of, of your own, but you're rehashing those content. I mean, come on, those content would not I mean, the probability of those content would be ranking high is low. So I usually see, uh, I have a framework and I usually tell it to all my readers, all that, like, these are the four framework that you should be uh, focusing on when you're picking a niche. Number one, that you should pick a niche that uh, that is less crowded for a topic that not everyone can get in easily. You know, like, for example, drones or AI, I'm just giving you a rough idea, or blockchain. Uh, or or stock trading, you know, like something that not everyone can get in. It requires a significant amount of time where uh, to acquire the knowledge and to write about it. Second, mm -hmm. you want to pick a topic which has the longevity, right? Like, for example, if you're writing about starting a blog about iPhone 13, hello, sir, you got one year to <laughs> rank and survive. You know, iPhone 14 would come and you're out of the business. Of course, you want to pick a topic which has a longevity. Uh, uh, so there are multiple topics which has the longevity and how I see it, pick a topic today which nobody is looking at but will be big in three or four years. So you might start slow, but in two years, you know, if that industry will grow, sir, you will be one of the smartest guy ever. Uh, the third is the monetization uh, and which is a challenge if you're picking a very, you know, less known niche, but you can always figure out ways to monetize. Otherwise, there is always Google AdSense and Media.net. Uh, fourth is a trend. So these are the four things which I usually see everybody to look at and that's how to get started. Now, uh, of course, the how many blog posts do I need to write before I can make money? Uh, there's, no, there's no fixed answer to that. Some people can make $100 with like six or 10 blog posts. Some people write 50 blog posts, but they're unable to make $100 a month, you know? Uh, so it all depends on what kind of training are you doing? Like, are you training yourself right way? If you're training yourself by reading the content online from 10 different bloggers and, you know, which works for a lot of people, uh, but sometimes you need a proper training from structured training from A to Z so that you can, of course, you need to add your own element or your own learning uh, and, and then you can grow faster. 
interesting. Now, <coughs> you mentioned something there. People potentially watch 10 different people. Um, they, they could watch you, they could watch me and, and eight other guys and get different opinions um, and different ideas from us all. Would you recommend that as a good thing or would you try and say follow two or three guys at most? Yeah, I think following, you know, first understanding uh, the two, three people whose values align with your values and then following them because you're not just following their ideas. You're also following, uh, you know, there's two kind of follower here. Like, you know, you see a person and you want to be like, hey, I want to be like this person, how he does this stuff or how she does this stuff. I want to go in that direction. That's one way. The second way is the competition, right? Like, you know, hey, I see this website, which is like, oh, very interesting. So you won't look at the person behind it. You would look at the website from SEO perspective. So there is two way to look forward to it. Uh, and I would suggest like, you know, narrow down your focus to two, three people. Uh, and of course, keep an eye open for a lot of other ideas. Like always keep looking for, keep your radar open for new and interesting people. But look at where they're coming from. What are their values? Is their values aligned with yours? Uh, yeah, by all means, follow. And then, you know, uh, of course, you you would succeed sometime. You would not succeed sometime. But the idea is that your win should be more than your failure. And when you fail, get up and start running again. You know, that's the only way you could reach there. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now, based on learning, do you ever go to, like, affiliate conferences to learn more uh, you know from other affiliates at all or or not because i know we, we obviously we've spoke at several conferences um together um including out in milan but that wasn't for affiliates as such that was more marketing mar yeah. business or whatever you want to call it uh, but do you ever attend or learn from other affiliates and uh, you know what conferences could you suggest uh, yeah, I always love conferences. I attend them as a attendee. I attend them as a speaker. Uh, the first conference which I uh, which I think I went for as an affiliate, where I'm just an attendee, was Affiliate Summit Las Vegas, uh, Affiliate Summit West, and I was I think like it was one of my best decision to travel from India to hey, who's this smart guy? Uh, okay, I know this one. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I, I went from India to Vegas and that's where I met many interesting people from the industry whom I known online for many years. When I met with them, you know, uh, we went for lunch or dinner or breakfast or after parties, you know, like that's where you make real connection with these people. And, you know, that's where people open up, share their st story, share how they are doing things. You share your things. Those are the things that you would not read online. So going to the conferences would make a significant difference in the life. But don't just attend the conference. Don't just listen to the talk. I don't think I go to a conference and I spend a lot of time listening to what people are talking on the stage because I can always read them, find them uh, on, on YouTube later on. Or you know, since I'm paid for it, I can always have the membership access. But the real cream is the people who are attending from different parts of the world. Reach out to them, talk to them, ask them like, hey, what brought you here? What is the, uh, you know, ask them about their journey, ask them about what they do, why they do, how they do. And you can ask them all this question over a cup of coffee, over a, a glass of beer, over a dinner table, over breakfast table. And the people that you really like, you know, make them part of your uh, network, you know, or you become part of their network. And you would be surprised the kind of value you would get from these people is immense. Uh, some of the conferences that I really like is the Affiliate Summit West, Affiliate Summit East. I've never been there, but I've heard great stories about them. There is an Affiliate Conference happening in Bangkok, which I believe, Craig, you are going there, my friend. I'm not actually going to that one. They just, uh, I spoke at the last two. Um, okay. I'm not going to the next one. Uh, it's, the next one I'm going to is in Dubai, but now nah, I'm not going to Bangkok, sadly. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Okay, so yeah, Affiliate Summit, um, um, Bangkok is catching up. Then there is Affiliate Summit India, which is also, if you are in India, and I believe like, you know, that's going to be very big in two, three years because India is really becoming huge, especially in this region. So, yeah. Um, no, and I'll see, I'll, I'll see you in the Dubai one, for sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's awesome. But Duda has put in there, so you're going to conferences for the networking. 
I'm going to be honest, the last the last two conferences I was at, I was in Malta last week and I was in the US the week before. I didn't watch one single talk. Um, I chose who I wanted to speak to, cornered them in the lobby, fed them full of beer, and uh, got, got, got the information that I was looking for. You know, I have to, when I go to a conference, I don't know if you're the same, Harsh, I, you know, we all know roughly what SEO is and what we're doing. There's just certain things where I'm like, this guy is doing something and I want to pick his brains and I want to dig deeper. So I zone in on a specific bunch of people and I'm like, yeah, let's meet up, let's have a drink. So we sat in the lobby for... Um, three days at each of those conferences um, talking about what I wanted to talk about, not necessarily what was being presented on stage. And some people may see that as being ignorant. It's not. That's where I'm getting my value from. Like you say, just get, you know, relaxing, just t- sharing knowledge is where the golden tips are coming from, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, and one thing which I always do, you know, I always, when I, let's say if I, if I meet you in one of the conference, I would, I mean, of course, you know, we talk about a lot of stuff, but I would always bounce my problem with you. Ah, that's, that's my friend, very good friend uh, on the left. Shlomi, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So what I usually do, and this is one thing which I do, like when I see a smart people like you or anyone at a conference, I bounce an idea or a problem statement which I'm facing right now through them. You know, like, I know that people would pay like probably $500,000, $2,000 to spend time with you for an hour, right? Like, yeah. to get your mind. And here you are at a conference hanging out with some of the smartest dudes in the world. Don't talk about silly stuff, you know. Ask them about the real problem. They are the smart people, you know. Give them the real challenge because these people are the problem solver. I like to solve problems. When people come and ask me, like, hey, how are you doing? What's up, you? I mean, that's nice. Give me a real problem. Let's let's have coffee discussing some real good ideas or a problem that makes me think, makes makes my you know mind work. I would remember those conversations way more than just talking about like how's the weather, you know? Yeah. Nah, say hell with that. <laughs> but um when you know we're going back to affiliate marketing here. You talk about making money on websites and all that kind of stuff. Do you ever flip them on? Uh, I'm going to make the assumption you you must have at some point uh, sold a few of your websites in the past. Is that something you regularly do? Or I know Shout Me Loud's a big thing, and you probably never want, never want to sell that in particular. But maybe some of the smaller websites, you ever sold anything like that? On? I never did, to be honest. No, no, please. Um, yeah, that's something I, I do quite a lot of it now. Um, buying scale, how's that working out? Like, uh, and how, how, how do you monitor the revenue source of one blog to the point? I mean, you, you, there's no big tool that can, you know, if you've got multiple websites, you have to have, you know, log in, check your Amazon associates, your, your analytics, your AdSense. Ezoic, whatever you're doing, um, which is a, a bit of admin. Um, there's no quick way to to monitor that. Um, but how does it, how does it work? Um, it works very well for me. Um, you know, you're getting fifty times uh, or up to fifty times your uh, monthly monthly um, for an affiliate website. So let's say you take a a, a pets website and you invest five grand in content, five grand on links, and that equates to £1,500 a month worth of revenue, you can sell that website for £150,000. Now, I'm not saying those sums, you know, you can only spend £10,000, but I think for a lot of time, effort, with a bit of, uh, you know, knowledge and experience in terms of doing keyword research, um, you, you can easily scale these websites in certain niches, like you say, Harsh, you can hone down into a very specific website. But something else I would add to that is everyone is obsessed with ranking well in the UK or the US. You know, there's so many untapped countries out there. Spain, France, Germany. These have, you know, got massive amounts of people um, that are relatively untapped in terms of SEO competition. So I think... 
you know, you have to again think bigger, think be creative, think outside the box, and you can scale websites up in these countries relatively easy and flip them on for a lot of money. So for me, I thoroughly enjoy investing um, in websites, but in particular, Harsh, what I'm looking for is someone who's maybe done a lot of content and they've just not been able to piece everything else together. Um, so I'm going to come in, do some link building, you know, touch up a few things. I might change out some of the monetization methods and then sell it for a massive profit. So it works. Yeah, well. I mean, 50x is amazing, right? Like rather than working for four years, you just like get, you know, make all the money in like one go. I mean, that's fantastic. Uh, I've never looked into it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's that's a very good suggestion for a lot of people, you know, like who, who are like more, who are looking for a different way to monetize. I mean, you're basically domain flipping or the website flipping is definitely one very lucrative uh, uh, avenue. Thank you for that, Craig. Yeah. <laughs> Not just for, for to give people a bit of encouragement at the end, you know, because it is a lot of pain, a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication. Um, but there can be a lot of money made throughout the, 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 on a month-to-month -month basis, but also potentially on the resale value of that website. So um, it works out very well. But sadly, Harsh, that hour has gone very, very quickly. Um, where is the best place for people to get a hold of you? Um, is it shoutmeloud.com or is there another source um, yeah, sh sh shout loud is where you can read my stuff, but Twitter at the rate of Den Hirsch is where you can connect with me. You, if you want to reach out to me, you can send me a DM. My DMs are open for everyone, and of course, all smart questions, smart interaction are always welcome. It doesn't matter if you are starting out, you are intermediate, or you are a pro. I always love love talking to smart people. Um, yeah, and Twitter at the rate of Den Hirsch. Check him out, guys. Um, but for now, Harsh, thank you very much for taking the time to come on and share some of those tips. And, guys, the link is in the chat if you want to follow um, Harsh on Twitter. So thank you again, everyone. Lovely.